Welcome to this uh, already fifth webinar uh, for the Nordics. Um, before I start, I, I'll just quickly go over the guidelines again. Um, so the presentation will be a little bit longer than 45 minutes. I, I did it uh, two days ago and it, it took about 50, 55. Um, there's always room for questions. Uh, if you have an urgent question, you can just uh, put the question. And uh, um, Martin, or, or Eric will, uh, will will disturb me if it's a, a, a question that is urgent, and otherwise we'll leave it uh, until the end. Um, as most of you have participated in early earlier webinars, I will not introduce myself extensively, but shortly. I'm Gino. I, I've been with Fermentus for about three and a half years. Um, uh, I'm an expert in fermentation uh, in, in cell metabolism. And uh, I uh, represent Fermentus in the Nordics. Uh, in the Nordics, we collaborate with uh, with Caldic, which is our main distributor. And today we have both Martin and Eric uh, on board of the webinar who will moderate. So Martin, Eric, if you could please introduce yourself. Definitely, Dino, thanks. First of all, I'd like to uh, welcome, of course, all of you uh, to this uh, fifth, I believe, in a series of eight uh, webinars. A big thanks to uh, to Gino for organizing this. My name is uh, Martin Jensen, and I'm a sales manager with uh, Caldic and been so for the past four years, uh, selling brew ingredients in all of the uh, Nordic countries. Apart from uh, fermentis, we sell a lot of uh, malts and uh, and hops, eggs, etc. Pretty much everything a brewery needs. And together with uh, my colleague Eric from uh, Norway, as uh, Gino mentioned, we will act as uh, as moderators, so should you have any questions, just put them in the chat and we'll uh, disturb you. And should you have any questions or, or comments, otherwise uh, you're welcome to contact me as well uh, after the, the webinar, mail or telephone. We are ready. Eric? Yeah, that was me. Uh, Eric Stenberg. <laughs> I'm uh, Kaldik in Norway, selling brew ingredients in uh, Norway. Been doing that for three, almost three and a half years. So, yeah. Okay. And then we have you, uh, uh, of course, as brewers. This is uh, actually a picture from Stockholm. Uh, or no, it's actually from Estonia, but it, it represents you. So... As mentioned, today uh, we do the fifth webinar, uh, which is focused on yeast uh, hop interactions part two. Uh, I will focus on, uh, on Brut IPA, uh, the impact of hopping regime and single hop uh, yeast interactions. Uh, but before, uh, I will do a short uh, um, uh, introduction, uh, mentioning again the New England IPA, because it has been a few weeks, just um, as, a, as, a, as a reminder, as a, as a follow-up. Um, so let me get started. Uh, before uh, I go into detail, I, I just briefly introduce the company. So Fermentus is a business unit from uh, Le Safre. Um, uh, Le Safre is quite a big company, uh, uh, mainly focused on, uh, on, on baking. Uh, but in total, there are 10 business units, uh, and one of them is, is Fermentus. This is the business unit that is focused on fermented beverages. We are based in Lille, which is, is uh, I'll take my pointer, which is here in the north of France. And uh, our production facility, in total, we have uh, within the La Safra Group 63 factories, but uh, only a few uh, focus on, on uh, pr production of, of uh, yeast for brewing and wine and, 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 and the beverages. Um, and this factory is, is in Ghent. Uh, it's shown on this slide and in the first webinar, I went into details um, on, on the factory, so I'll, I'll skip that for today. Um, so, as mentioned, we work in the world of fermented beverages, uh, beer, wine, cider, spirits, any drinkable alcohol. And we have two main products, yeast and yeast derivatives. Uh, today will be again on yeast, but in the, in the following webinars, I'll talk about yeast derivatives and also uh, bacteria. So what is yeast? Yeast, uh, we call it a living treasure. Yeast is a, is a fungi. If you look in the tree of life, uh, you see it, it's, it's here. It's quite close to animals and, and plants. Um, 
so if you look genetically we are not that far away from uh, from from yeast actually and that's why yeast is is often used as a model species for all kinds of uh, of, of disease related research it is an uh, asexual or sexual organism um, it's quite small four to eight micrometers um, and in nature there are it's an estimate around 200 different species could also be 300,000 or, or, or 150,000. This is uh, this is roughly based on, obviously on the on the amount of yeast that are already on the market. So then they can make quite good estimates what's what's present in nature. So industrially, so the strains that you can buy, uh, it's, it's it's narrowed down to like a few hundred, few thousand strains. It's just only a small portion of the nitrile diversity. But uh, it is, if you consider, you know, the, the, the straight application, it's, it's quite a lot. So for beer, we have two main species, uh, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the top fermenting ill yeast, and the Saccharomyces pastorialis. And I already explained in previous webinar that this yeast is quite exceptional because it's a hybrid between Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Saccharomyces eubayanus. It originated in somewhere in the wintertime in the brewery, uh, and it's discovered quite recently, actually, that, that this is the case. Only in 2011, it was uh, identified as a, as a hybrid. <coughs> so uh, in Fermentis, the current portfolio, uh, just quickly, we have three lager yeasts and all the others are ale yeasts. Uh, these, uh, the SAF ale range is our like standard yeasts. Uh, then we have also the South Brew range, uh, which is uh, yeast or yeast uh, um, uh, enzyme mixes, so products that are not fitting into this self ill category. So we have the L01 for low alcohol beer, which the next webinar will be on. And then we have HA18 and DA16, which are yeast enzyme uh, mixes. And today I will obviously discuss uh, these, uh, in particular DA16 because that's a yeast that can be used for, for producing Brut IPA. Then a big difference, uh, since today uh, we have two bacteria actually on the market. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have Lactobacillus plantarum, uh, LP652, which is a, a, a homofermentative uh, lactic acid bacteria producing lactic acid. And today we will launch uh, a new bacteria, Cefsour LB1, which is a uh, Levy Lactobacillus brevis. Uh, it is a, it is a, a heterofermentative bacteria, so it's not only producing lactic acid, but also it can produce acetate uh, or acetic acid and ethanol. So you have uh, the scoop here because, to my knowledge, this has not been mentioned <laughs> to anyone um, before. We also have two uh, other products, like one functional product, Spring Blanche and, and Fermentation Aid, uh, you like yeast nutrients. If you have a, a, a low uh, uh, low nitrogen word, you can add this uh, for, for the yeast health. So these two are considered as yeast derivatives. So what do all the yeasts have in common? Obviously the alcoholic fermentation. I've shown this before, where you convert glucose to CO2 and ethanol in a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, if you look in, in, in weight, uh, then about 180 grams of glucose is converted in 88 grams of CO2 and 92 grams of ethanol. So if you put your fermenter on a, on a balance, on a scale, uh, you can measure the weight loss. Okay, based on the weight loss, the amount of ethanol that is produced. You need quite an accurate uh, scale for that, but anyway. <clears throat> if you look a bit more closely, because this is obviously very simplified, um, then there was a professor, Professor Balling, who was actually a, a, a German professor uh, from, I don't know, 18 or 17 something. Uh, and in 1843, he came up with this equation. It's called the Balling equation. Uh, where he found out that one kilogram of sugar is actually converted in these amounts of CO2 and ethanol, but also a little bit of yeast, obviously. So uh, in total, about 5% of, of the fermentable sugars is converted into yeast. 
Uh, actually, well, I'll, I'll do that in the, in the next slide. Um, so in the brewery, uh, and the alcoholic fermentation starts obviously first with the, with the, the mashing process uh, where you create fermentable sugars. Depending on the profile, you will uh, create a, a different composition. So if you have a standard uh, mash profile with, you know, uh, uh, a rest at, at uh, uh, 62, 63 and 72, uh, then you will end up with a composition uh, shown here. So 10 to 15 percent glucose, 50 to 60 percent maltose, 10 to 20 percent maltotriose and 15 to 20 percent dextrins. Obviously, if you change the scheme, so if you do a high temperature mash, you will end up with more uh, higher sugars. If you do uh, like a maltase um, mesh scheme, uh, then you will end up with more simple sugars, more, more glucose. So already as a brewer, you are in control in the amount of available sugars uh, in the world. Well, when these sugars are fermented, so <clears throat> uh, based on the amount of sugars, which is normally uh, uh, displayed as, as Plato's actually, and, and Plato uh, comes from a, a, another professor, uh, called Plato, and then you have Brix, which is uh, which is, uh, it, it finds its origin in uh, in a professor called uh, Mr. Brix. So all these these terminology is always related to you know somebody that worked on on uh, on, on typical brewing uh, research. Anyway, um, if you convert uh, these sugars in fermentation, so the fermentable sugars you produce, as I mentioned, ethanol and CO2, these is in the you know gram per liter range, uh, but also quite a lot of glycerol, which is also in the gram per, uh, per liter uh, range. Uh, glycerol uh, adds uh, 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 and feel of the beer, like the, the viscosity of the beer. It's an important component. Uh, then you make acids, obviously way less than, than these two. It can be all kinds of acid, acetic acid, citric acid, succinic acid, depending on, on the exact metabolism and the exact conditions that you apply. As mentioned, you make biomass, about 5% of the total fermentable sugar goes into biomass and you make aromas. And obviously you also end up, depending on the mesh scheme, uh, with uh, residual sugar. And also not only depending on the mesh scheme, but also depending on the yeast, obviously. Some yeasts are able to, uh, to ferment maltotriose, others are, are not able. What is most interesting for us as brewers is obviously uh, the aromas, uh, the flavor. These are produced in very low quantities. Uh, you have to think uh, uh, in terms of uh, parts per million, parts per billion. So around 100,000 times less than, for instance, ethanol and, and CO2. But we are lucky because uh, as humans, we have very good uh, receptors in the nose and in the mouth and the throat, um, uh, which enable us to be able to taste this extremely low levels of, of flavor. And this is a, a simplified version of, of the, the yeast flavor metabolism. Just quickly, you start with sugar that enters the cell, you go through glycolysis um, and you produce, for instance, ethanol, you also produce obviously CO2 on the way, as shown in the, in the previous slide. But also, in you know, through various uh, complex metabolic pathways, you, you produce esters, uh, like acetate esters, which is, is the, the product of uh, of uh, acetic acid and an ethanol uh, or uh, and an alcohol. Um, so two of the main uh, uh, esters that are produced by all yeast uh, are isoamyl acetate, so the pineapple fruity banana, and ethyl acetate, which is uh, more the solvent nail polish-like fruity flavor. Um, in beer, this, this both are, are desired, uh, but depending on the style, obviously in different quantities. So if you produce a lager beer, then you want these to be very low. If you produce like a triple or a, or a New England IPA, you want these to be high. Um, ethyl acetate uh, is normally lower than isoamyl acetate, um, but, but the, the ratio between these two is uh, is important because you can use it actually as as a as a as a as a standard for for the quality of of your beer. Uh, ethyl acetate is is desired uh, in 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 beer, but Obviously, uh, if you make like a, a, if you are a winemaker, then ethyl acetate is actually an off flavor. 
so it's not only uh, depending on, uh, on, 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 on you know, the, the, the desired demand, but also what is important is the type of beverage that are uh, that you are producing. Then you have the fatty acid esters, uh, which are uh, even in lower concentration, but can be very, uh, very nice. You have the, the, the phenolic flavors, which are only uh, produced normally by, by POF positive yeast. So the yeast that, that are able to convert ferulic acid to four vinyl uh, guaiacol. And uh, just to mention, the ferulic acid comes from the malt. So if you would do a fermentation based solely on glucose, you can use a POF positive yeast because in that case there's no ferulic acid and no 4VG will be produced. So you can, you know, use sometimes a, a, a POF positive yeast. To, they are normally extremely fruity uh, to, to uh, introduce a lot of fruitiness, for instance, if you make like a hard seltzer or something. Then you have some off flavors. Uh, most common ones uh, are, are diacetyl. Uh, uh, diacetyl is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a compound that is normally produced in, in all uh, beer fermentations, but it can be easily uh, removed by introducing a rest. So put the, the fer fermenter at somewhat higher temperature and the yeast will take up the diacetyl that has been produced. Another important off flavor are the, 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 the sulfury off flavors, uh, in particular H2S, which smells like rotten eggs. I think many brewers have experienced uh, this, uh, this off flavor. Uh, if you brew, uh, you, you will at least uh, have this one or two times in your, in your life. It's, it's a flavor that is, is harder to remove. So it's better to prevent uh, th that, this, uh, th that, this, uh, that this happens. So if you think about you know this this all this flavor diversity, all different uh, uh, compounds that can be produced in different quantities, uh, you might wonder where is this flavor diversity coming from? Well, part of it, uh, it comes from the different genetic background, and that's shown here. And so the genetic background of of the portfolio of the fermenters yeast. I will not go into a lot of detail today. Uh, I just highlight that you know some typical strains like these two, uh, BE134 and WBO6, are both POF positive strains. Uh, so they make this phenolic off flavor and they cluster together in this this beer. So genetically, uh, they are they are related more closely than, for instance, the WBO6 and the SO4, which is further away. If you look at uh, you know just on the on the genome level. So the question is, is genetic diversity flavor diversity? I think we can say yes, at least uh, to a certain extent. Uh, but you can also change the conditions, as I mentioned in the in the previous uh, uh, or two webinars ago. If you if you change ferment fermentation conditions, uh, you also change or are sometimes change the flavor profile. So to make some sense of, of the soup and give you some direction in, okay, what yeast should you select for, you know, what type of beer? Um, we have made a baseline, we call it, uh, which are fermentations that are, are done multiple times on in, st in these conditions. So a 15 plate of word, 25 IBU bitterness uh, using iso alpha extract, so no hop addition. Um, but just uh, to add some bitterness, uh, we pitched uh, all these at 50 gram per hectoliter and fermented at 23 degrees uh, under atmospheric pressure. Then if you do a sensory analysis, um and and score you know all the flavors uh, that that are produced you can come up with uh, with this slide we, we decided to, to to position the yeast on three axes fruity spicy and neutral and then based on the sensory profile under these conditions we position the yeast on the axis so for instance if you want to have a, a produce a quite a neutral beer uh, with limited addition of fermentation flavors, then USO5 would be a good candidate. If you are looking to you know a more fruity beer, you can follow the fruity axis and then select any of these. If you want to introduce some spiciness, it's it's you can look on on this axis and find like these yeast. So this is just to give you an idea on, okay, which yeast uh, would be good for, for uh, you know, which flavor profile. But as I showed before, uh, th these can move around. I showed uh, two webinars ago results with W2470, 
which is like a, a German stone. It doesn't move at all, uh, no matter the conditions. Uh, you can you can uh, you know do a lager beer on high temperature, um, so say at 20 or 22 degrees, and still end up with a neutral uh, uh, profile. While the B256 uh, was moving around uh, in, in 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 this area. Uh, based on the on the conditions, so if you change the gravity or the pitching rate, you saw that the BE two five six could deliver a completely different flavor profile. And today we will add another layer, uh, and that is hops to this. So it it will become a little bit more complex, guys. So uh, as I as I mentioned, uh, we we already uh, saw the impact of fermentation conditions, but what happens if ingredients change? Um, so then you are talking about yeast hop interactions. Uh, so far, this is uh, this is a mystery box. Um, there is some literature available, but but not much um, because it's still it's it's a kind of an unexplored area, um, and and people are now just getting into it. In, in, in you know yeast hop interaction, biotransformation, uh, the potential of, of 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 typical yeast to release typical flavors from hops or additional flavors from hops. So we, we looked into this and um, I showed already a, a little bit uh, last uh, webinar um, and highlighted the New England IPA. If you, if you look at this beer style, it's, it's like a hazy IPA. It looks like, uh, you know, orange juice. Um, it's low in bitterness. Um, uh, but this is typically the first example that got us into this whole hop yeast interaction work. So let me just quickly uh, uh, go over the, this, this style again. Um, the most interesting new flavor descriptor when it, when it came into the world, which, which was uh, like only two years ago, was the term juicy, uh, juicy or hazy ale, but in particular the juicy was, was a new uh, flavor descriptor. And uh, so if, if, if there is a new beer style and we are, we are trying to find the best possible yeast that could fit uh, very well this style, uh, we, we, we start with these flavor descriptors. So uh, what we did is uh, we had one type of uh, New England IPA recipe. I'll, I'll show that in a minute. We added three hop varieties and nine types of yeast to find out, okay, which one would be best to produce this style. We use two lager yeast and seven ill yeast of which two positive uh, of positive. So we al already know that these would be out of style and also the lagers would be out of style. But these are good controls if you do experiments like this. So the recipe we used, I'll, I'll, I'll just go over it quickly. Uh, it was a simple mash scheme, so standard. 40 minutes 63, 25 minutes 72, one minute uh, mash up at 78. We added in the word some, some oats and wheat to, to contribute to the haziness uh, of the beer. Um, we added three uh, types of hops, uh, Citra, Semco and Mosaic, and these were chosen based on, on you know, basically the, 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 the hops that have been used on the market so far to create uh, the, these New England IPAs. So many brewers were already using Citra, Semco and Mosaic. Uh, so we, we just said, okay, let's also go for these to be able to, you know, get the best possible and, and most applic apl applicable results for, for brewers. We dosed in, in, uh, in uh, so we split up this one kilo in, in four parts. We dosed uh, 15, 25% uh, uh, after 15 minutes whirlpool. Uh, we uh, dosed 25% after two days of fermentation. And we dosed 25% after four days of fermentation. And then at maturation, so you could consider this as that classic dry hop step. Uh, uh, so after fermentation, we, we added the rest of the 25%. So what came out? Uh, I'm just showing a few characteristics. Um, uh, if you look you know, on the beer style, what is important is its turbidity level and juiciness, as I mentioned before. But if you look at turbidity level, um, you already see on this picture that some some beers are, are could be suitable, like this one is hazy, this one is hazy, this one is hazy, but also some are not hazy. Some beers were bright, which are an indication that these yeasts uh, are probably not the best option for New England IPA. So if you score that, it's normally done on a, on a scale between uh, zero and so from, from clear beer, brilliant beer, to, to very uh, hazy beer. 
uh, then we could already uh, highlight three possible candidates strictly based on on the on the turbidity of of the beer that could be good candidates k97 so4 and s33 so we did a lot more but i will not show that today because i, I showed that uh, uh, already uh, last time um, so if you combine all the results uh, together you find this spider plot um, which uh, uh, on which here all the flavor descriptors are written so these are scales between zero and eight you see all this for the different flavor descriptors and then you can see okay some uh, yeasts uh, could be very suitable like if you look at turbidity level for instance s33 is on top if you look at hop character then you see uh, k97 is performing best etc so this is quite complex uh, so what you can do is a so-called principal component analysis, uh, which is basically mapping the data in a different way um, to make it more accessible, more visible uh, uh, for you. Um, so what you see here on this slide uh, are the, the things in red are the, um, the, the active uh, variables, as we call them. So in this case, these are the flavor descriptors and the, th the, the, the dots in blue are the observed variables, so the things that we, we measured for this, and in this case, the only variable that we had was the yeast. Um, and these are positioned based on, you know, the flavor profile, the total sensory profile that we measured. And then you see that four yeast came out as best candidate for, in particular, juicy, hop citric, hop fruity, hop character, turbidity level, which is relevant for this particular style, the New England IPA. Now we did analysis, uh, so we also looked at, at uh, the sum of total hop esters, hop oils, um, and also on the individual level, and we made again uh, a, a, a principal component analysis, and so map uh, the yeast of the, or the data that we got from the yeast, uh, in this case on the measured uh, um, variables, which in this case are, are obviously hop components, so myrcene, Total hop boils, linalol. Uh, you see a lot of, of uh, it's it's too much actually to to be visible. But in total, I think we measured around twenty five different uh, hop hop components. And then you see that uh, uh, if you look at the the the, the observed uh, observed variables, so the different yeast, then you see SO four, S thirty three, K ninety seven, T fifty eight, S one eight nine, all on this side. So on the side where you have the most hoppy uh, hoppy notes if you remove them these uh, red factors so if you just for clarity you find that these three yeast SO4, S33 and K97 are, are the best options for producing New England IPA obviously just to show you uh, we measured as I mentioned uh, uh, the hop oil and the hop oil content but if you simply look at the total sum of hop oils we found out that okay all these different yeasts, so these are exactly the same fermentation, exactly the same conditions, only variable is the yeast. Um, then you see that some yeasts are able to liberate more hop oil than other yeasts. And so for the, for the New England IPA, S33, K97, and SO4, they are all on the high side of, of, of extraction of total hop oils. So, which is interesting, if, if you compare it, for instance, to USO5 or to BE134 or BE256, are all lower. So this is an indication that the yeast is actually doing something with the hops. And so far, the hops, uh, you know, we, we always used combinations of hops. And in, in this case, for the New England IPA, it was uh, uh, Citra, Mosaic and Simcoe. So that overcomplex things, because we don't know if the hop oil comes from from uh, the mosaic or from the citra. But what we just know is that different yeasts produce different amounts of total hop oils, or at least result in total amount of hop oils. So <clears throat> I'm gonna skip this. So the second case uh, uh, that we looked into was the Brut IPA. And Brut IPA, I'm not sure if any of you uh, ever uh, already brewed uh, a Brut IPA. It's a new style also. It, it has been uh, originated, I think, uh, somewhere last, last year or, or even early this year. No, I think last year 
uh, like half tw 2019 or something. So new style means new sensory attributes. Um, typical descriptors are uh, it should be dry. So no uh, or, or very low uh, amount of residual sugars. It should be uh, highly carbonated and it should be very uh, aromatic. And uh, our sensory uh, expert, Gabriella, always says, think of a sparkling glass of, of dry champagne, but with fruit forward hop aromas. So it should it should look like a beer, like something like this, like, like a champagne style beer. Obviously, you will not have a lot of foam uh, if you brew this beer style because uh, you dried it out completely. So there's no residual sugar. So the, the only way of, of, of still creating some foam uh, layer is, is mainly based on protein and, and uh, amount of polyphenols. But that's 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 not enough to, to create like a creamy foam layer. You also need some some residual sugar normally. So just accept the fact that it is this is not uh, that much foam on, on the beer. So looking at the style uh, we and, and, and trying to develop a solution for this style, we, we looked at the following uh, objectives. Uh, okay, it should be dry. So we say, uh, we stated the apparent degree of fermentation should be at least 90%, but preferably higher. It should be a fast fermentation. Uh, we need to be able to create up to 16% ABV. And this was chosen, uh, you know, uh, quite a long time ago. If you look now on the on the style descriptors, I, I checked this this week, um, and typical ABV levels of, of Brut IPA are between 7 to 12 percent. Uh, if you look at the, the Beer Judge uh, certification program, so um, the 16 percent is, you could also put it at 16 percent, but then you might be out of style. So depending on, on you know the final decision on, on, on the people that make the style guides, this could be also 12 or 14 uh, in the end. Some guides already, as mentioned, uh, state that 12% is, is the maximum. But anyway, we didn't know when we started this research. So we said, okay, we need at least to be able to go up to 16%. It should be non-diastatic yeast. It should be a fruity flavor expression. The reason why we said non-diastatic is, is because all diastatic yeasts are also puff positive yeast, so they produce this uh, phenolic off flavor. You can imagine if you produce a, a fruity champagne style beer, you don't want these phenolic notes in the beer. Um, then another important aspect, we need to be able to push the hoppy flavor, so hoppy flavor should be enhanced. And obviously, as always, we don't want any off flavors. So the solution that we came up with, uh, obviously also based on previous experience with uh, with the HA18 yeast, which was which was originally intended for uh, for to produce barley wine, we said okay, a mix of of Saccharomyces cerevisiae and amyloglucosidase, uh, which is an enzyme. I will I will go into detail. Uh, in a mix, should be able to to produce uh, a nice brut IPA. So first, quickly on amyloglucosidase. Amyloglucosidase is an enzyme. Um, it normally works perfectly at 60, 62, 65 degrees, way too high for fermentation, obviously, but it will also work at lower temperature. So what is, what is this yeast uh, or this enzyme doing? It hydrolyzes the 1, 4 and 1, 6 alpha linkages in amylose, so in starch. So if you look, and this is uh, just a screen, a, 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 a shot of, of uh, starch. So starch are, uh, is no more than a lot of sugar molecules uh, in a row, and then they are also cross-linked. So different uh, different uh, rows of, of glucose are cross-linked. This cross-link is the alpha-1-6 bond, and the, this link between these two glucose molecules is the alpha-1-4 bond. So what this enzyme does, it, it cuts this these bonds, so you end up with only glucose molecules. So you can apply this in your mash if you want. And so if you add amyloglucosidase in, in the mash, uh, you can make a, a, a word that only consists of, of, uh, of glucose, but you can also add it to the fermentation, um, uh, which will work because if you have an enzyme 
uh, if you, uh, I'm just going to show it like this. You normally have an activity curve that looks like this. It's it's a it's a, like a small mountain, and the optimal uh, activity, so the highest activity, is at high temperature, or at this optimal temperature, which in this case it's around 60, 65 degrees. But if you ferment, say, at 25 degrees or or, or at, at 20 degrees, you are still uh, having activity of of the enzyme, so it will it will still work. So what we did, uh, you know, to determine wh which yeast would be very good for this style, we we uh, made one type of, of reference uh, recipe uh, and added uh, six yeast enzyme mixes. Uh, one was POF positive. We added uh, three different types of hops, and uh, uh, as mentioned, six six mixes. Uh, we did fermentation kinetics, obviously. Uh, we looked at uh, glucose con or sugar consumption. We looked at the volatiles, and again, did a sensory uh, analysis. So this is the recipe. So we used six mixes in total: mix one, two, three, four, HA eighteen, and DA sixteen. Um, so those were for the, the yeast enzyme mixes. So it's fifty percent uh, yeast, fifty percent uh, amyloglucosidase. Um, the word we used was 14 plato it, it was uh, it was done because we didn't know you know where the style would end up in terms of abv um 85 percent pilsner malt and 15 percent sugar uh, we used sugar to ensure that we will would end up with a bone dry beer we did again a traditional mash key and added cascade mosaic and citra in this case only in the whirlpool we fermented at 24 degrees, uh, did the maturation for two weeks at zero. Um, we ended up at a bitterness level of 28 IBU for all beers and uh, an ABV of 6.5 to 7%. We carbonated at seven gram per liter, which is on the high side, but you, you know, you can, if you think about champagne, you can also go higher. Eh? You can go to eight or nine uh, gram per liter actually to really have a strong sparkling uh, beer in the end. But for this experiment, we did not. So let's go to the results. First, uh, fermentation and, and the sugar profile. So here on the y-axis, you have the degrees Plato. On the x-axis, you have the days of fermentation. You see that most of the yeast enzyme mixes ferment very fast. So they are done in two days. And one, mix four, was done in five days. Then if you look at the sugar level in the beer, so for mix one, uh, HA18, mix two, DA6, so for the different mixes here, you see if you compare it to the word, which was around uh, say 92 uh, gram per liter of total sugars, you see all all dried out. So the amyloglucosidase really did his, his job well, because here the residual sugar level is extremely low. So then sensory analysis, and this is, uh, again, a classic spider plot, but then opened uh, to increase uh, the visibility. Uh, here on the x-axis, you have the different flavor descriptors that are relevant for this style. And on the y-axis, you have um, the, the means of the result. So the amount of, of, of uh, tasters, in this case, it, I think it was 40, uh, a taste panel of 40 people who tasted numerous time. Uh, I'll not go into detail on, on that. Uh, but they scored between uh, zero and, and eight. And here you have this, this score listed here. So if you look, for instance, uh, uh, on one of an important character, it should be fruity. Uh, so if you look at the fruity smell, fruity odor, then you if you check, OK, which yeast is that? The one that stands out is the DA60 yeast enzyme mix. If you look at tropical notes, then we have two ones that are on the high side, mix four and the DA16 again. So overall, you can see, okay, if you check all this, which typical flavor descriptor uh, is high and which one is low. We have here one high on the phenolic side, uh, which is the HA18. It's the only POF positive yeast actually in this experiment. So this was also uh, expected. I'll, I'll just mention this, highlight it. So then um, we also did analysis, of course. Um, on the top left, you see uh, the parts per, per billion of uh, amount of hop oils, hop alcohols, uh, hop esters, 
the terpenes from the hops and uh, here you see the, the sum of the total hop oils for the different mixes. Well, if you look at the, the total alcohols, you see already there is some diversity. Uh, some uh, are higher, some are somewhat lower. Um, if you go to the esters and the terpenes, you see uh, a, a bit more diversity um, <clears throat> where two stand out, the HA18 and the DA16, they show the highest level of, of, of esters, which was uh, somewhat uh, expected. So then again, a nice uh, clustering. So the, again, the principal component analysis with in red, all the active variables. In this case, it's all uh, hop components that we measured. So linalol, geraniol, uh, myrcene, etc. And then the active uh, observations, which in this case are the yeast enzyme mixes. To make a long story short, the one that came out best uh, was, was DA16. Uh, and mix four, they both show a strong push towards, uh, you know, the important aspect of, of pushing the hop, uh, hoppy flavor compounds in, in this beer style. Um, it was decided to go for DA16 uh, mix to put that on the market first because that showed uh, the most fruity profile. So looking at, at the objectives, uh, fast fermentation, uh, high apparent degree of fermentation, fruity flavor expression uh, it was decided uh, that this one was the best option to start with the only thing that was remaining was the 16 percent abv that we said okay uh, we did all this this work but we ended up at seven percent abv but what if we go higher so the only thing that we needed to uh, explore was was the ability of the different uh, yeast to go up to 16 percent so what we did is we did some follow-up experiments on, on small scale uh, with the DA16 and the HA18. Uh, those were the two, uh, you know, that were, were uh, uh, selected for this experiment. We did, from, we, we did uh, uh, rehydrate the, these two at 30 degrees. Why we did rehydrate? Because this is a yeast enzyme mix. Uh, we rehydrate for 30 minutes. And then we also added uh, the yeast that is present in the DA16 mix without the enzyme. So the pitching rates were 100 gram per hectoliter for the for the mix, and the mix is, as I mentioned, a one-to-one -one, uh, weight ratio between the yeast and the amyloglucosidase. So you actually pitch 50 gram per hectoliter yeast uh, in in all conditions. We used two gravities, 20 and 25 Plato, and fermented uh, in this case at 25 degrees. With moderate agitation, these were shake flasks. So in the in the lab, they just decide, okay, we put them on the shaker. Um, uh, it's a bit it's a bit strange because normally in fermentation you do that, but that's what what they did. So if you shake uh, gently, shake uh, uh, you know uh, a beer or a fermentation, it will go. It can go a little bit faster, but it's not. For, for this these experiments that's not really important because we just want to see if if you reach this high alcohol level so these are the results of the kinetics um, here on the y-axis you have the ethanol concentration and on the x-axis the fermentation time so the days if you see first the green lines uh, both solid and the dashed lines these are the single yeast so without uh, the uh, amyloglucosidase you end up at around seven uh, to to eight percent uh, uh, ABV, depending on, obviously on the original gravity, and then you have the red and the blue uh, line, um, both dashed and solid for the DA16 and the HA18. As you can see, if you are at 20 Plato, you reach around what is it? Around 11.5, 11.8. ABV, uh, which is uh, the maximum that you can uh, can reach. Uh, also, uh, if you look at the 25 plate, which is here, you see you reach 15% uh, ABV, which okay, which made us conclude these yeasts are, are suitable to also go up to very high ABV levels um, if you want to produce a high ABV brut style IPA.
Then flavor, the volatiles that we measured uh, in, the, in the beers at the end. So we looked at higher alcohols and esters, and here are, are shown the totals. You see, if you have the single yeast uh, and look at higher alcohols, you see the amounts are quite high, even for the single yeast. So it means that the you don't get a lot of additional contributions from the amyloglucosidase, so from the additional sugar that is released. Um, both at 20 Plato and 25 Plato, um, you see that the DA16 uh, produces the most higher alcohols and HA18 is a bit lower, even lower than, than this yeast. And it's quite logical because this is another yeast. And looking at the total ester profile, uh, if you look at, uh, again, the single yeast versus uh, the yeast enzyme, uh, mix for DA16 and, and HA18 at 20 Plato and 25 Plato. You see again that the DA16 produces the most fruitiness, which we already kind of figured out from the previous experiment. Um, but this is a nice confirmation actually that it's also happening on, on higher ABV levels. So this, you know, made us for the, a new product uh, to produce uh, very dry flavorful beers like uh, a brute IPA but you can obviously also try to produce other styles uh, which need to be dry um, to sum up total esters for this uh, yeast enzyme mix is high as you saw a total amount of higher fusel alcohols is also high very high parent attenuation up to 102 percent Sedimentation is medium, so you have to be a little bit patient uh, to end up with a very bright beard like this or centrifuge, whatever you can do. Um, so if you, you know, are planning to, to brew something for, uh, for the Christmas holidays, <coughs> I suggest if you are starting this week, you might still be able to, to have something for New Year's Eve, um, it, but it might be already a little bit late um, if you also consider some, some maturation time. Um, so, so far, what I've shown uh, are two cases where, uh, uh, you know, to develop a new beer style and, and the, the yeast that goes along best for this style. So, so far, we, we, we looked at always different uh, hop varieties. This was mainly based from information from the market, as I said, but, but it overcomplexes the situation because you don't know what hop variety really uh, delivers what type of, of hop aroma uh, in, in, in this combination. So we said we need to simplify this because it's, it's already complex enough if you think about, uh, if you think about hops. Uh, as many of you know, uh, even if you buy Cascade uh, or, or, or a Citra hops, if you look on the on the hop terroir, uh, so on the on the field where the hop is planted, you can have different uh, flavor from you know hops that has been harvested from the left side, and and hop that has been harvested on the uh, on the right side from from the field. It's called terroir variety, um, uh, and and this is already you know in a single hop very complex. So. Imagine if you have three or four or five different types of hops uh, added, then it's very hard to, to draw conclusions in the end on the actual impact of, of the yeast hop interaction. So we said, okay, why not simplify and look at a single uh, hop uh, variety uh, in combination with, with different yeasts. So we decided uh, for these trials to go for cascade. Um, Cascade, uh, as, as you know, is, is still uh, one of the most used hops for, for producing IPA. It's still the most popular American hop. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think all of you know it's, it's nice in, in, in citrus spicy aroma. You can have some, some grapefruit if you're a very good taster. Um, but mainly the spicy citrus aroma is, is, is very typical for, for Cascade. to go for cascade so what we did and now I'll, I'll go into you know the impact of, of dosing regimes so we, we decided to go for cascade hop and then we we uh, decided to go for three hopping regimes so the first regime was late hopping which means 
you you put the hops uh, in in the in the whirlpool. And the second situation was dry hops, which means you put the the hops in in the in the fermenter. And then the third combination was a uh, was a combination of late hopping and dry hopping. So the amount of cascade that we added was 300 gram per hectoliter uh, for the late hop and the dry hop, and then uh, in total also 300, but but divided in two parts, uh, 150 and 150 gram per hectoliter in uh, in the whirlpool and and the fermenter. We used 11 fermenters uh, yeasts, three lagers and seven ales, of which three puff positive. And then again, uh, did the full uh, profiling, fermentation performance, volatiles, and sensory uh, to be able to, to, to figure out, okay, what's the impact of, of the yeast hop interaction uh, under these different conditions. So I'm going to skip a lot of information and go immediately to the clustering. Um, <clears throat> uh, again, here in red, you have the flavor descriptors, which are uh, limited in this case to a few to make it more clear for you. So these are the uh, the active variables. And then in blue, we have the observed variables. And, and what are the observed variables? Again, in this case, it's the yeast type. And in addition to that, uh, the hopping regime. So to give you an example, USO5, it's a yeast that you all use a lot. Here is USO5 late hopping. Here is USO5 late dry hopping. And then the other USO5 is here. It's uh, dry hopping only. So you see that the beer produced with USO5 is very different. So the three beers. So based on the hopping regime, you find a lot of differences. Basically, the you know the the the, the beers are all over the place for 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 a single hop. Uh, uh, if you want to make a bit more sense out of the soup i i decided to focus on uh, on two yeasts uh, that we already saw before the w3470 and the be256 so if you look at the be256 which is uh, in late hopping here in late dry hopping here and in dry hopping here you see it moved uh, like similar to the like, like the uso5 moved which means that these three beers only if you look uh, you only change the, the the hopping regime in this case uh, you make three completely different beers they taste completely different so the dry hop beer is way more floral than for instance the late hop beer uh, in combination with the uh, if you compare it to the late dry hop beer which ap appear to be more herbal then another interesting one is the w3470 as as we sh we saw in the in the fermentation uh, for, uh, for, uh, conditions uh, when we change that that we saw that you know the, the w3470 is is a, is a german stone it doesn't move it is very robust the the flavor profile remains neutral no matter what you do and interestingly it also doesn't move a lot if you change the uh, the, the, the 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 hopping regime because here late dry hopping late hopping and dry hopping are all all together which is very interesting. So this this is truly a German stone. It, it is truly a robust, neutral, not moving yeast. Also, if you look at the, at the, at the hopping regime, in this case, I can only say in combination with Cascade, you can never exclude that it will do something else with another hop, but with Cascade, it, it will not move. So what else is interesting in, 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 in this study? And the most, I will highlight the most three the three most uh, exceptional ones um, uh, we call them the gypsies because they moved uh, the most in 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 this experiment which are s189 which is a lager yeast k97 and the s33 so k97 and s33 already came out in the new england ipa study but also in this study and it's interesting that we have a new one uh, added which is s189 it's a lager uh, and if you compare you know the late dry hopping with the late hopping and the dry hopping you see it's three completely different lagers so you can produce a lager which has more herbal and more bitterness uh, perception uh, if you if you if you late hop uh, and you can produce more fruity general hoppiness uh, per perception if you dry hop um, and you can produce a more neutral uh, 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 lager beer if you don't uh, do any of those so it's it's very it's very interesting it's it's a uh, it, it is typical for s33 similar 
the differences are, 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 are big. And for also for K97, the differences are big. So to, this is just a, a sum up of, of the, all the things that we looked at. Uh, in this case, I'm showing it again in a spider plot. And the, the take home message here is just look uh, quickly to the, to the three images. And you see three completely different images. So in this case, the different yeasts are put uh, on the axis. And then the, the, the different areas uh, represent the flavor descriptors, so general hoppiness, floral, fruital, herbal, etc. So if you if you look if you check in on dry hopping and 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 compare or late hopping and compare it to dry hopping, then you see in general hoppiness perception you see that dry hopping has quite a big uh, effect, and it's different for for different types of yeast. If you combine the two, you see. Also, this area is quite big, but it's smaller. So dry hopping has actually quite a big impact on the general hopping perception, which is also seems kind of logical uh, if you think about it. If you look at fruitiness, uh, you see that uh, late hopping and dry hopping is, is somewhat similar. It's quite a big area. And also the combination is, is, uh, is, is displaying quite a, a nice area. So. If you want to really go into detail, um, you, you can analyze these separately. But the most important take-home message here is, as I mentioned, these are all different. So if you change the, the hopping regime, you will change the flavor profile of, of your beer. So that's what I mentioned, the key learnings. Um, and as, as I also indicated, the most interesting hops uh, are S33, K97, and S189, because they moved uh, the, the most uh, uh, if, if you use different uh, hopping regimes. So what would be the impact of, of primary uh, uh, fermentation flavors produced by the yeast on the overall hop perception? Because what we saw is that if you uh, have, well, the, the yeast that stand out in this case, are quite fruity yeast. We know that. We know that from previous study. We know that from the baseline study. But the question is, does this help in uh, in, the, in in actually pushing out the overall whole fruity perception? So, is a fruity yeast a yeast that produces a lot of fruitiness in the beer uh, automatically also generating more hop hop fruity perception? Um, because we had indications. So we figured, okay, if we want to, to check that out, we have to compare also the situation where you don't hop at all. So that's what we did in a follow-up experiment. So we had one blank, uh, so no hopping, no hop addition. And then we decided to go for late and dry hopping as a comparison uh, with the, the, the situation where, where you have an unhopped word. Then again, we did a detailed sensory analysis. And, and analytics, as I mentioned before, to check out the differences in, in the beer flavor. So these are the results. Um, first, uh, here on the left, again, you have the flavor descriptors uh, in the unhopped situation. And uh, on the right here, the hopped situation for the different yeast. These are different colors. I will, I, I will highlight uh, them uh, uh, in, in, in the next slides, because now it's the colors are a bit uh, close together so you don't see a lot of differences uh, you know between uh, the, the strains but if you look overall you see that you know the picture uh, is very different in the hopped and unhopped uh, situation so in the hopped situation obviously you have more general hop expression more hop citric more hop, hop tropical than in the unhopped situation which here is is like it's nothing or, or very low I, I should say so let's look at these uh, a little bit more elaborate so these are the results again in a, in a spider plot uh, so this is a, a, a that is opened to, to 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 you know give you a little bit more more uh, visibility on the on the results because spider plots are, are quite hard to read so in the unhopped versus the hopped situation for all these different yeasts and now i hope you can see the differences in in color um, 
some typical things I can highlight. If you look, for instance, at fruity, the global fruity perception, you see that some yeast stand out. Uh, in this case, the green one, which is the K97, shows uh, the most uh, fruity perception in second in line S189 in this case, also quite high. And then we have the, uh, uh, the, the S33 and the, and the others. If you look at general hoppy perception, again, K97 stands out. Uh, also, USO5 is doing quite well. Uh, if you look at floral, um, you see that uh, in this case, it's the S189 and that is producing the most floral notes. And um, if you look at tropical notes, uh, you see again that uh, K97 stands out. And so this is still quite complex. So let's break it up uh, into the three different uh, yeast uh, strains that we use. So the POF negative, POF positive ales and the lagers. So here are the results with the lagers in the unhopped versus the hopped situation. And as you can see, uh, if you look at uh, fruity global expression, uh, you see if you hop the beer, so if you use the combination of late dry hopping in this case with Cascade, then you see that the S189 will produce the most uh, uh, fruity uh, uh, perception right? because this is tasting. Then if you look at the other descriptors that are uh, that we find relevant uh, in this case, so hoppy, floral, uh, all hop flavors, then you see that they all go up, obviously, if you hop. Um, and again, the, the, the red one, which is the S189, is on top. So uh, this confirms a little bit what we saw before, but uh, in this case, uh, it, it's more clear because it, it com uh, compares the hot versus the on hot situation. So actually, S189 is quite an interesting <laughs> lager yeast because based on this, uh, you could say, okay, if you want to make a hoppy lager, um, the best possible choice is is to use S189. Uh, it, it's it it works better than, for instance, the most used yeast, which is W3470. But you see, the W3470 doesn't move that much. It's the is the S189 that liberates the most typical hoppy flavors and the most uh, overall fruitiness. Then look at the puff positive ones. Uh, so actually, the ones that that uh, uh, are, are often out of style. Um, that uh, if you think about brute IPAs, uh, the, these are, are out of style normally. Um, again, we compare the unhopped versus the hopped uh, situation. And here you see differences, but they are not that extensive. And the reason is this big peak. And uh, you see uh, quite a high phenolic peak. This is logical because these guys produce a lot of 4VG, 4EG, all these phenolic compounds. And if you look a bit more closely to that, then you see uh, the level actually in the hot and the on hot situation is quite similar. So which, which made us conclude that as soon as you have a POF positive yeast, it's very hard to, to say uh, and, and to discriminate in perception a typical hop aromas, typical fruitiness, because uh, the, the phenolics are, are actually dominating uh, and also masking somehow uh, the, the, the hobby notes. So you have to be an extremely uh, experienced taster, you know, to, 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 to catch differences in, in, you know, typical fruitiness. Um, it is possible, but, but for, you know, the average taster, it will be very hard because this phenolic flavor is so dominant. Then the puff negative yeasts, uh, obviously th these were, were also very interesting results. Again, if we look at uh, the, the global fruity uh, expression, so perception, we see that there's one standing out, uh, which is the K97. Uh, so K97 and Cascade is a very interesting combination. And we already saw that, that K97 uh, was very interesting for New England IPA. Uh, so it worked well with, with um, uh, Citra, Mosaic and Simcoe, um, but obviously also with Cascade. And Cascade is the mother of, of, of Citra, Mosaic and Simcoe, basically. So this is quite a nice confirmation. In second, you see uh, S33 stands out in, in Fruity Expression, which was also a little bit expected because we already saw that S33 is a very fruity, fruity yeast. 
then if you look on the on the push on, on typical hop aromas by the yeast then you see uh, k97 is is the star in this case so k97 in combination with cascade um, also uh, uso5 s33 do well in, in the general overall hoppy expression if you look more on floral notes uh, s33 stands out uh, citric notes uh, again s33 so based on all this you see okay uh, this the, the hopping has a big impact and some yeasts work better with cascade than other or not even work better but they produce more flavor uh, than, than other yeasts which was a confirmation actually of of the the things that we saw in the new england ipa study but in this case only for a single hop so if we do again the principal component analysis to uh, to map the data in a, in a, in a more visual way um, again we have here the red factors which are the active variables so the typical flavor descriptors and in blue the observed variables we see uh, two areas an unhopped area and a hopped area which is quite cool uh, so this is nice clustering of of the data uh, it, it it adds up. It 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 it, uh, it seems to, uh, to to be uh, logical. Then, if we look at the phenolic yeast, so the wbo 6 be 134 t 58 these are the the puff positive yeast. Both in the unhopped and the hopped situation, they also form a nice cluster here on top. So this is also logical. Uh, a logical result. And then if we compare all in the in the unhopped versus the hop situation, you see you, you end up with, with this. So these these are uh, 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 again in red the, 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 the active variables in blue, the different yeast, so the observations that we did. And then if you look you know at, at uh, which descriptors are, are, are like the fruity, floral descriptors, they are all uh, on this side. And then if you if you map all the different yeasts, you see uh, indeed K97, S189, and S33 are, are all in this quadrant in the unhop situation. Then in the hop situation, we find that the K97, S189, and S33 are also all on this side. So this is quite interesting if you because uh, uh, it, it's, it supports the idea that if you have a fruity yeast, it will also support the fruity hop uh, characteristics. So the 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 the, the, the fruity. So we say, okay, is this the synergy? Could this be synergy? So to to make it a bit more clear, even uh, you can remove this phenolic vector uh, so to so remove it from the data set to get an even higher uh, uh, visualization of the results and if you do that uh, from from the hop situation you have here the the result of the hop situation minus uh, the, the 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 pop factor so the the phenolic factor that we left out and then you see you have the three yeast again k97 s189 and s33 stand out so uh, in comparison with the unhopped situation uh, here you, you again see that k97 s189 and s33 all three push out uh, the most hoppy uh, aroma also from 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 the hops uh, which is interesting because these three especially s33 and k97 are already fruity yeasts uh, we know that from previous study but also we can add now the a lager yeast s189 uh, in combination with Cascade to introduce, you know, a nice hoppiness. So if you combine all and, and sum up the results uh, for, for this latest single hop uh, uh, Cascade uh, uh, versus yeast study, then we, we can, we concluded that, okay, if you want to produce a, like a floral hoppy a herbal uh, style of, of beer, you can use the S189. If you want to be more on the fruity side, then you should go for the S33. If you want to go for more tropical notes, tropical fruitiness, uh, then K97 in combination with Cascade is 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 the the best choice. Obviously, it's uh, the all the research is still ongoing, um, uh, so we are not done yet. This is also very new research, 
and, and we are still looking into all the data to even extract more relevant information that you can use uh, as a brewer to make you know the beer style and the beer uh, flavor profile that you want so final conclusions um for the new england ipa yeah, can be quick s33 k97 and sf4 came out best for the Brut IPA, uh, I showed that DA16 is the most aromatic uh, yeast enzyme complex, uh, showing also the most uh, fruit forward uh, uh, hop aromas, and therefore a very good uh, solution for, for dry beers, uh, in particular uh, Brut IPA. And then the last part, uh, yeast and, and single hop interaction, so yeast and cascade. I showed that the hopping regime uh, has a big in impact on the on the uh, on the hop flavor perception of the beer. So different uh, hopping regime means different uh, beer, basically beer, beer flavor. And then some yeasts uh, will move. Other yeasts are quite neutral. I indicated the W3470, and we, we saw it before. But also, if you change the hopping uh, regime, it doesn't move. Uh, in, in, in the case where we add cascade, uh, because you can never know what happens with with another uh, uh, with, with another hops, and then we we indicated uh, three gypsy yeasts, uh, S33K97 and S189, that that change uh, the hop flavor perception the most, uh, um, and therefore are very interesting uh, yeasts for follow up study and also for US brewers to to start uh, using maybe for to produce for instance a, a hobby lager and that's concluded here and so s33 k97 and s189 uh, pushed out the most hop forward flavors so there is a synergy between the fruitiness produced by the yeast in combination with the fruitiness produced by the hops and as i mentioned uh, we, we are still looking into this uh, to to extract you know what exactly is is going on but you can imagine it's very complex even with a single hop and with that i'm at the end of the presentation I, it took a bit longer I'm, i apologize for that uh, i just want to highlight again the fermenters app uh, it will be updated uh, in december uh, or early january it's but there is a new update coming up with with a lot of new information uh, added uh, uh, possibly also information that ha I have been showing in the past webinars and also future webinars. So it's 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 going to be a nice tool for you to uh, to help you in, in brew the beer that you want. So the next one is uh, is next week. The next webinar it will be on uh, brewing low alcohol beer with Saf Brew LA01. Uh, it will be a bit shorter because I will only focus on uh, on uh, on one yeast, which uh, obviously simplifies things a bit more last but not least uh, again if you have time uh, I, I would very much appreciate it if you could complete this questionnaire uh, so far I already received uh, more than 380 uh, responses uh, and this will help me to prepare you know the webinars of, of 2021 and hopefully also you know the physical meetings again and uh, let's hope that that will happen um and all your input is 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 is, is used and looked at uh, in december january uh to to figure out okay what are your exact needs um we go uh we we just decided to go via these these forums because the amount of of, of emails that you otherwise would get is is hereby uh, reduced and uh, so this is is basically for us it's it's more easy and with that, I reached the end of the presentation. Uh, I didn't see any questions coming in in between. So I'm not sure if everything was clear, <laughs> but uh, ask some questions. So we have one comment question from Bart. Uh, thanks, Bart. Uh, for your for your uh, comment, um, my, your next batch will be brewed with K97, but also gave you some ideas on your cucumber brewed Weizen recipe using HA18. Okay, very interesting. Uh, cucumber brewed. 
<laughs> would be very interesting to taste. I, I never added cucumber myself to a beer, so uh, it could be interesting. Well, Gino, from uh, our side, I just want to say thank you uh, once again for a very informative and, and, and good webinar. And I know that I am looking forward and a lot of other brewers are looking forward to uh, to next Friday with the uh, LA01 brewing uh, low alcohol beers. Good. Good. Okay, guys, then thanks. Have a great weekend. If you, I know you're, you're probably also still in, in, in lockdown or, or half lockdown. Uh, I just want to mention, you know, keep on supporting your local breweries. Uh, if they have, uh, I see it in Holland. A lot of breweries are are, uh, are, are having services of, uh, of of takeout, or or you can uh, uh, order beers uh, um, online and have them delivered at your home. Uh, I think it's important in this in this you know very difficult situation, in particular for uh, for the craft brewers uh, to support each other. So if you decide to have a beer, you know drink local and, and and try to order at at you know your local brewery to support them getting through this this difficult time okay thanks a lot guys and see you next week thank you bye guys